I guess we'll get started. Um, today we're going to learn first a little bit about rocks and then we're going to learn a little bit about fossils. So if you saw the video that I put on YouTube, um, you know that there are three types of rocks and that today we're going to focus on one type in particular and that is the sedimentary rocks. So the other type of rocks are the igneous rocks. Those are the ones that come mostly from volcanoes. So that means rocks that were previously very, very hot and they turn into liquid and then they cooled down and they hardened and they became igneous rocks. So we're not gonna worry about them today. We're not gonna worry about the metamorphic rocks today. We're actually gonna talk about them probably next week because next week we're gonna talk about comets and craters and meteorites and all that good stuff. So this week, what we wanna focus on are sedimentary rocks. So that's a really big word. It's got a smaller word in it, which is the word sediments. And sediments are basically um, just little bits and pieces of bigger rocks that have broken down into smaller. So here I've got a little container full of rocks. So you can see they look kind of like beach rocks. They're kind of smooth. Those would be big sediments because those came off of a bigger rock and broke down. Um, sometimes sediments look kind of like this. And this is kind of like what our trail is made of here at Manuals River. So like little bits of rock and dirt. And sometimes sediments look like this, which is of course, sand. And we've probably all seen sand at some point or another. And sand is just teeny, teeny, tiny little pieces of rocks that have broken off. So sediments break off of bigger rocks in a process called weathering. Weathering just means big rock breaking into smaller bits. And then sediments might get carried around in a process that we call erosion. So if anyone has been out to Manuel's River lately or pretty much anywhere because we've had so much rain, you've probably seen somewhere where a bunch of sediments got picked up and carried away and they're missing now. So we have some spots on our trail where there are like kind of holes or big ditches in the trail because the water has come and carried all the sediments away. And that's just what water does. It's always carrying sediments and moving them around. And at Manuel's River, it carries the sediments all the way out to the end of the river. And a lot of times it dumps them in the ocean. So the ocean is full of sediments. And if you've ever gone swimming at the ocean, you've ever gone to the beach, then you know there's lots of rocks and sand and little bits all over the place at the beach and under the ocean. So when water is carrying those sediments around and dropping them off, they can build up and build up over a long period of time. And I'm talking right now like millions and millions of years because it takes a really, really long time to make a rock. Rocks have a really, really long life. So much longer than anything we can even really think about. It's hard to wrap your head around. But if you had a river that was moving some rocks around for millions and millions and millions and millions of years, they would start to build up and make sort of like a layer. And what's going to happen to these bits of sediment is you might be able to see there that there are sort of holes in between all the rocks. The rocks don't fit perfectly against each other. There's, there's space in between all the rocks. And that space is called the pore space, P-O-R-E. And it's not poor like pouring water. And it's not poor like you did poorly on a math test because you didn't do very well. It's poor like little tiny holes. And you actually have pores in your own skin, which you are all probably too young to see very well on your skin. But if you look on a grown up skin, you can probably see it. They're like the little, little holes. You probably see them on your nose. Um, your sweat comes out of your pores. So pores are just little holes. And so there are little holes in between all the sediments that are building up over time. And now remember water is carrying sediments. And water is also carrying things like minerals. So this is just regular old salt, which is a mineral. And what happens is water carries the minerals and drops them in between the rocks and the sediments and into all the pore space. So you can see it kind of fills up there. And then when the water goes away, it solidifies, it cements, and it turns into a rock. So we'll have a layer that looks kind of like this. And you can see the sediments that are still in there, and then there's minerals all in around it, and it will become completely solid. And what it ends up looking like when the minerals and the sediments are really big, you end up with a rock that looks like this. It's called a conglomerate. And you might be able to see those chunks of color in there. Those are individual rocks. Those are the individual sediments that you can see. 
And you can find conglomerate if you go out on our trails and you look at the rocks that are just underneath the waterfall, that's all conglomerate. And you'll see chunks of little rocks stuck on the inside of the big rocks. Um, and if you've ever gone up to Signal Hill in St. John's, then you've also seen some conglomerate because Signal Hill's got big chunks of conglomerate where you can see those little individual sediments. So sometimes your sedimentary rock is made up of sediments that are big enough that you can see. But a lot of times what ends up happening is you get sediments like sand and they're really, really small and you actually can't really see any of the space in between the sand. And so this will form a rock called sandstone. So maybe after, you know, 30 million years, you start to get a bunch of sand buildup. So you'll have your layer of conglomerate and then you'll have your layer of sand. And, and you'll have some minerals that go in the little pore space here and make a new rock. And then after a while, you might get some more rocks on top. And eventually you'll start to see layers of different types of rock. And we're very lucky here in this part of Newfoundland because we can see those layers out in real life. So if you walk down our trails and you go downstream toward the ocean and you look up, all of the cliffs you see will have layers of shale in them. And if you stand and you look out at Conception Bay and you see Bell Island, it looks kind of like a little cake. And it's got all those layers in it because the rocks have built up in layers as water has dropped all of the sediment down over time. So that's a sedimentary rock for you, or a couple of sedimentary rocks forming here. Now, a sedimentary rock, as I mentioned, is the kind where you're going to find a fossil. So what is a fossil? Well, a fossil is when there's a piece of a plant or an animal that used to be alive and it gets replaced by a rock. It turns into a rock and it lasts for a very long time. So this right here is a bone. It's a jaw bone from um, an elk, probably a baby. It's quite small and you can see it's got little teeth in here. So it's probably a baby. And so if this bone used to be a living animal were to fall down onto a mud puddle somewhere. There would be lots of sediments around, lots of little bits of mud. And slowly over time, more sediments would fall on top and cover it up. And you would start to see the outline in those sediments. And so eventually this would all get covered up and the bone would have made itself a little space in there and the rock is forming all around it. Now, of course, bones do eventually go away. It will, this bone will eventually dissolve, but the rock that's around it will still be there and it will still have an outline and it will show us what that bone used to look like. So we'll get a chance to make a couple of fossils in a sec, but first we're gonna try a little bit of our candy and bread demo to get an idea of what this looks like when living things things that used to be alive get trapped between layers of rock. So we won't use a bone for that one. Stick that over there. Making a mess as always. So grab yourself some bread. I got my pumpernickel as I mentioned and I got some old hot dog buns that were sitting in the Manuals River fridge for some reason. And as I mentioned too, I've got some Swedish fish. And I am gonna use fish just to make it, you know, realistic because a lot of times sedimentary rocks form in places where there's lots of water. So lots of fossilized animals are animals that live in the water. So I'm using some fish. So I'm gonna take my first piece of bread. And I'm going to imagine that this is the ocean floor. So it's, uh, it's covered in sediments, maybe it's kind of muddy. And looks like I've got some red fish that were swimming around, living their lives, swimming around. And you know, sometimes fish die. Maybe these fish just got really old or maybe they got sick. And when they die, they fall down to the bottom of the ocean. And they kind of sink down into the mud a little bit. Okay, all well and good. And then some more sediments are gonna kind of fall down on top of them. And over time, you know, more water's gonna come in and drop more sediments and drop more sand on top of them. 
and eventually we'll get a whole layer of sand on top of them. So that's going to be our next piece of bread. So there we go. So maybe that took, oh, I don't know, 20 million years and we got enough sediment on top of them now to cover them up and make almost a whole new rock. So 20 million years have gone by. Let's see if I can get some other fish going here. What I got? Oh, I got, I got an orange fish at this stage. Okay, my little orange fish. So he's swimming around, living life, life is good. And then he gets old and he dies and he falls down to the bottom and we'll squish him in there. He gets buried in some sediments. All right, now we're going to have sediments are gonna keep building up over millions of years and millions of years. So let's say another 20 million years have gone by. All these sediments have built up on top of our fish. Boom. There we go. All right, so we'll do one more because I still got lots of fish. So let's, maybe there's tons and tons of fish at this point in the ocean. I got one, two, three, I'm gonna put four fish. There were lots of fish alive at this point in time. We'll say 30 million years ago. All right, so we'll stick them in there. Very good. So they've fallen down into the sediments at the bottom of the ocean, and then some more sediments have come and fallen on top of them, and 20 million years worth of sediments. Well, so we got our ocean floor going through different millions of years. So we got some once living fish in there, and they've been covered up by sediments to make rocks. Now, what we're lacking here is pressure. And that's really, really important because if these were rocks, they'd be really heavy and they're just bread, so they're not. So what we need to do now is squish it over a long period of time to make sure those fossils actually form. So what I'm going to recommend you do is wrap it up in plastic. So I'm going to stick mine back in the bread bag. And you know, it takes a long time to form fossils. So I'd say you're gonna probably wanna leave this here with a book on top of it, probably until the weekend to make sure that you had enough time for those fossils to form. So I got my handy trilobite book. I'm gonna stick that on there and I'm gonna leave it for about two days. So I did this on Monday. So we can have a look at what one of my bread and candy sandwiches looks like from Monday and see if it forms some fossils. All right. So here we go. So you can see right away it got kind of squished. Um, in particular, my hot dog layer, my hot dog bun layers were obviously not very strong, so they squished pretty good. But here we get a good idea of what layers of sedimentary rock look like. And that really is kind of what Bell Island looks like. You know, it kind of comes up out of the water like that, and you can see all these different layers. And sometimes you get different color layers, different colors of rock. And that might tell you something about how warm the ocean was when it was forming or how much oxygen there was to breathe when it was forming. So geologists can learn all sorts of stuff by looking at things like the colors and the layers. All right, so let us take it apart and see if it left any imprints of our fish. Ah, all right, so we can see uh, it's easy to see on this layer, so hopefully everyone used at least one light colored layer. There's like a little imprint where my fish used to be. And so that's the same type of thing as all the sediments rain down, they kind of get pushed out of the way by whatever living thing is sitting there. And so you get left with this sort of hole and it did also do it on my pumpernickel bread side, but I don't know if you can see it quite as well, but it left some holes. Where the fish was and it's the same outline it gives us the outline of the fish's body and that's what a fossil does it gives us an idea of what the body looked like it's a direct outline of the body now you also probably notice i used some red fish in this layer and the hot dog bun has got a little bit of red on it and sometimes what happens and you might find when you try this experiment that you don't actually your fish end up kind of gooey and gross. Mine are like pretty gooey and gross. And they might not make a very nice fossil. They might just make like a gross goo all over your layer of rocks. And so that's all right. If you find that that happens, then you're actually seeing a slightly different process. You're not seeing a fossil being formed, um, but you're actually seeing more like a fossil fuel being formed. So sometimes when living things die and they get covered in sedimentary rocks and they get pushed under a whole lot of pressure, 
um, they turn into things like oil and coal. And oil and coal are things that we call fossil fuels, and it's the kind of stuff that we put in our cars to make them go. It's how we heat our houses. Um, and they're sort of like kind of gross, sticky stuff that forms in between sedimentary rocks. So if you don't get a fossil, but you get a bunch of weird, gross, sticky stuff going on, then instead of making fossil made probably more like oil instead. And that's another interesting process too, so that's not so bad. So if you want to give that a try, you can make your layers and put your candies in there. Oh, it looks like I did orange fish on this layer. Yeah, it looked like they worked, they worked all right. We got a hole there. But then this fish is kind of goopy and falling apart. So maybe he's turning into a fossil fuel rather than a fossil. And that's all right. And it will really depend on how wet your bread is, whether or not it works out for you. So I put orange fish in that layer. And then, you know, these are millions of years apart. We got different kinds of fish living there. So then this layer, I put, oh, I put green fish in this layer. So you made a little green guy. Oh, just one green fish. And then yellow fish in this layer. There you go. So you can give that a try with whatever critters you want. So I suggested maybe using candy creatures because normally when we have fossils they come from things that used to be alive um, uh, but I also suggested you could use something like eggs because sometimes eggs turn into fossils so if you've got some candy eggs lying around you could use that too um, but if you just got candy anything and you want to use it you can still get the same idea so I'll get rid of these guys do we have any questions so far about how fossils form in a sedimentary rock none just yet Madison the next thing we might want to do, so that was how we made some bread fossils out of candy. If you'd like to make a fossil that lasts a little bit longer, I suggested you could make one out of uh, Play-Doh or clay or something you might have around the house. Um, so in this case, you're going to want to take, this is your opportunity to make a couple of different kinds of fossils because there are a couple different kinds. Um, so we're going to look at a mold fossil and a cast fossil, and those are both types of body fossils. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about a trace fossil. So taking a look at our mold and our cast fossils here. So I'm going to use, for this example, um, a little insect, because insects fossilize really well, because what fossilizes in the world is the hard parts of the animal. And insects are covered in hard parts, right? They're covered in shells. Um, so that's going to fossilize really well. we got lots of insect fossils in the world. So if you take a little bit of Play-Doh or clay or whatever you've got, and you roll it out in a ball, then it's easy to squish it down. And if you just want to take your critter and you just nice and easy, you just sort of squish him in there, squish him into your Play-Doh, and then you pull him back out again, he'll leave behind kind of a hole, right? And it will be kind of pushed down underneath the surface of the fossil, and it'll be an outline of his body. And that is your mold fossil. That's your simple easy, looks like the outline of the animal, great. And so what happens there is the animal got all covered up with sediments over time, and then eventually his body just dissolved and got carried away by water, and what was left was just the hole where he used to be, and the rock has that shape. So that's a nice easy one. Now, sometimes what happens, so his body gets dissolved and gets carried away by water, and there's nothing left behind but air. Sometimes what happens is in this hole that's left behind, another rock forms or another mineral forms. And so then you get one that's called a cast fossil. Madison, there's a question. Yeah. Uh, is that a real insect that you, you're using? No. <laughs> this guy is made of plastic. <laughs> So if you want to make one that looks like a cast fossil, what you're going to have to do is sacrifice your little critter and you lose him into your fossil. Because what you have to do is you stick him in there 
and wait for him to dry and then you paint him over and cover him over. So I made one earlier with a shell from a snail. This is a real one. This is a shell from a snail. And I took some of my clay and I squished the shell in there to make my mold fossil. So it's like a little hole. And then I took another piece and I put the shell on top. So it puffs up over the top and I painted over it. And so you can see how the mold and the cast go together and they're kind of like mirror images of each other. So if you want to, you know, if you've got like a shell that you want to use and you don't mind not getting it back, then you can just stick that in your clay. And when it dries, you can paint over it, paint it the color of your clay and just leave it there. And that will be your puffed up uh, cast fossil. So those are two options if you want to make body fossils. So again, we're going to see what the animal's actual body looked like. So in this case, we're going to see how big the snail shell is. We can see how many times it spirals. That's all really, really important information if you're a paleontologist. Uh, with our insect here, you know, we can see how many segments he's got. We can see what his little tail looks like. So if you're a paleontologist, you're learning lots of stuff about body fossils. But there's another type of fossil that you can make if you'd like. Um, and that's called a trace fossil. And a trace fossil is something that tells a paleontologist a, something about the animal without showing its body. So a trace fossil might be something like the eggs of an animal. Um, so if you were to find fossilized eggs, then you could say, oh, this dinosaur used to lay seven eggs, or this dinosaur's eggs were really tall or really skinny. Um, so you can learn lots about an animal by looking at the trace fossils. And another thing that we sometimes find are the footprints of an animal. So if you feel like making a fossil of yourself and you can't lose your own foot, what you can do is roll out some of your dough and stick your foot in it and make a footprint trace fossil of yourself. And that could be really useful. You can actually learn a lot from looking at the tracks of an animal. Um, if an animal has really sharp claws, you might learn that it likes to hunt things, right? That could be really useful information. Um, if an animal has two legs or four legs, might give you some information. Some animals have two legs and wings, right? So we know that they get around with their wings. So you can learn a lot of information by looking at an animal's hands and feet. So you want, might make one of those, that's a good idea too. I probably don't have enough here to make my foot, but I might be able to make one that's big enough for my hand. And you don't have to just do animals. So if you had um, like a tree branch that you wanted to use, you could do that. So we found some fossils of um, old evergreen trees. We know that the oldest evergreen trees used to be in New York because people have found those fossils. All sorts of things you can use. But just think about, it's sort of the hard parts of the animal that are usually left behind, like the bones and the shell and the twigs of the trees. I see we got lots of Play-Doh going on here. Wicked. <laughs> so, do we have any questions about molds or casts or trace fossils? No? Okay. Last thing I want to show you are some of the fossils that we have here at Manuel's River. So here we have fossils that are about 500 million years old. They're really, really, really old. Some of the oldest fossils in the world are here in Newfoundland. And The fossils that we've got here are mostly from creatures called trilobites. So this guy's a trilobite right here. And these guys are called arthropods. And an arthropod just means that he has jointed legs. And there are lots and lots of creatures in the world that have jointed legs that are arthropods. So that's things like lobsters, spiders, centipedes, all the insects, bees and butterflies. Um, and the trilobites don't exist anymore. They went extinct about 250 million years ago. Um, but a lot of other arthropods are obviously still around, right? We've all seen centipedes and spiders all over the place. So just these guys didn't quite make it, but there's still lots of arthropods in the world. 
So um, it's called a trilobite because he's got three lobes, trilobe. Um, so he's got one in the middle and two down the sides. So that's just kind of a little part of his body is just got these sort of weird little segments on them and little lines down them. And then he's got a head up here called a cephalon. This part's called the thorax. And then he's also got a tail part. So this trilobite here has a really long tail. Some trilobites have just one spike. Some don't really have much of a tail at all. There's lots of different types of trilobites, about 20,000 different types. So I'm going to show you some fossils where we can see this thorax part of the trilobite to give you an idea of what some of our fossils look like. So we, we got, have a question, Madison. Yeah. Kaden is wondering, how do you know how old it is? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so um, I was talking about how rocks form in layers. So uh, we know that rocks at the bottom are the oldest rocks and the rocks at the top are the youngest rocks because the first rocks to get laid down are here and then 50 million years later some more rocks and then 50 million years later some more rocks. So we know that there's sort of an order to how rocks form. Um, and then we use um, different elements to look at how old rocks are. So um, there's, for example, there was a big meteor that hit Earth and created a big crater down in Mexico. And when it did that, a special element called iridium went up into the air and floated all over the Earth and then landed. And so we know when you see that iridium layer inside the layers of rocks, you know, oh, that's at the time when the big uh, crater was formed at Chicxulub. So that gives you an idea of exactly where in time things are. So you kind of have to look relative to different things that are happening on Earth to try and figure out, oh, okay, well, that was about 50 million years ago, and we had dinosaurs at this time. And so it's about looking at the different things that are inside the rocks and the different things that are in the layers themselves. Uh, but elements, elements are, are a complicated thing for us to get into today, but they're basically what the rocks are made of um, and trying to understand where those came from and how long they've been on Earth for. Um, so the planet is about four and a half billion years old. So that's kind of your, your end point. You know, none of the rocks are older than that. Um, and then you kind of have to figure out which ones are older and younger relative to where they might be found in the, in the layers. So that's a good question because we got some pretty old rocks and it's kind of hard to imagine like human, human beings were not around back then. So it's hard to imagine that what the world was like. Um, so we have um, one of our fossils here. So you can see um, there's the one lobe in the middle and two lobes around the sides. Hopefully we can see that. Let's try to get the light on it at all possible angles. So that would be a lobe down the middle of our trilobite and then two down the side. And then we have one here. This would have been a very big trilobite. You can see in the middle and then two down the sides here. And again, this is, we're just ca capturing a little bit of the trilobite's thorax. We're only really grabbing that little piece of it. So this trilobite here would have been quite big, right? His head would have been up here, his tail would have been down here. And the biggest trilobites that we found so far are about a foot and a half in size. So kind of big if you think about these guys being related to like insects. We don't usually see insects that big nowadays. And we have a trilobite question. Yeah. Uh, did trilobites bite? <laughs> yeah, they definitely did. <laughs> there were definitely some predator trilobites. So some of the trilobites would have been like scavengers. Um, they would have just grabbed dead stuff off the bottom, whatever they could find. Um, and some of the trilobites probably ate plankton, like the little tiny floating organisms in the water. But some trilobites were predators. So they went around and they had eyes so they could see things and they hunted things down. And they probably would have had some good sharp mouths to sort of eat their prey for sure. And this little guy here, hopefully we can also see he's got a bit of a head on the top there. And he's got a little bit of his tail. So this is almost the full trilobite here, about six inches or so. So that's a couple of our trial bite examples that we've got, some of the bigger ones. Um, in our center, we can also see some of the little ones where you can see the whole body, because a lot of times the really big ones just don't survive because the rocks are really, really old and eventually they break and the fossils get destroyed. So we're lucky that we can even see, you know, part of a big trial bite is pretty cool. And this fossil here, this one is bumped up. So this would be our cast. And this fossil here, is sits down underneath the surface of the rock. So this would be our mold. 
And sometimes when we're out of the fossil site, you pull a fossil apart and it's the mold and the cast. You can see both halves of it, which is pretty cool. So I know the weather is starting to get really, really nice. So if people are out on Manuals River looking for fossils, um, just remember that that is our protected fossil site. So if you do find anything cool down there, you have to make sure not to bring it with you or take it away. You have to leave it there so that other people can see it too. Do we have any other questions about trilobites? Or questions about fossils? No more questions, just yet. Make sure you leave your, um, your bread and candy sandwiches sitting for about two days if you really want those fossils to form. I left mine sitting for three days, so if you're really patient and you leave it for three, then hopefully that'll work for you. And um, yeah, if you wanna send me a picture of some of the cool fossils that you're able to make, that would be really awesome, I would love that. And um, yeah, if there's no other questions, then One more, next. Madison. Oh, How okay. <laughs> How long does it take to find a fossil? Oh, well, you know, honestly, we're really lucky here at Manuals River. We have a really productive fossil bed. There's a lot of fossils in there, and people can mostly find a fossil if they spend a couple of hours looking for it. But if you were to just go somewhere new that you'd never been before and you didn't even know where to start looking for fossils, you could be looking for days trying to find one because only certain types of rocks are going to have them. Um, they have to be the right age, they have to be um, the right type of rock, they have to be a sedimentary rock, so uh, it can be really hard to find a fossil if you just go out there sort of like out of the blue and try to find one. Um, we're lucky here people have been finding fossils since like the 1800s, so we knew there were some there, so that makes it a little bit easier. If you've got an afternoon you can probably find one. But that's kind of what makes the fossil, the fossil special too, is that you don't always find one. Sometimes you go looking and you just don't have any luck, and so that means when you do find one, it's pretty exciting.